Okay, I suggest we start today's um, final episode of our webinar series, Investment Mediation Insights. And how fitting as this series is coming to an end um, that I am able to share with you that last week we submitted um, the exit proposed rule amendments to our member states, including the mediation rules, uh, with a vote expected uh, during the month of March. And if adopted, the mediation rules will enter into force in July. Of course, the mediation rules can already be adopted by agreement of the parties with a request for exit to um, assist with the administration of the mediation, which already has happened in practice. So to start out with, um, let's just review briefly our mediation activities, our recent activities besides certainly the work on the rules is to support our friends at the Ancestral Secretariat um, in the context of working group three on investor state dispute settlement reform and um, the work on mediation guidelines uh, generally. And that is also building on the two papers that ICSID produced last year. One is um, an analysis of investment treaty provisions on mediation, as well as a background paper on investment mediation, setting out information to um, provide insights into how investment mediation works. Besides all of that, of course, um, this webinar series is meant for practical insights um, to move beyond the theory, but to hear from practitioners and participants who were um, part of an investment mediation. And today I'm very delighted to have with me three experienced mediators, all of whom have participated as mediators and led investment mediation. Starting with Mercedes, Mercedes is known to um, all of you from publicly available information on investment mediation that concluded in 2020. So welcome, Mercedes. We have Martin Hauser, who is also a very experienced mediator who has participated in investment mediations, not only as a mediator, but also as a counsel. And then we have Bill Marsh with us, um, who has mediated investment disputes with parties um, from different continents. So welcome to all three of you. We have more in-depth um, information on your biographies on our website, and Damon will put that link in the chat. So before we start our um, webinar today, the format is usually as we've had an informal conversation that we are having attendees and participants, please feel free to put any questions that you may have in the chat and then we will pick that up um, along the way or certainly at the end. Good. With that background, so over to you. Let's start our conversation. In your experiences of investment mediation, as mediation as a facilitation of negotiation between the parties, what is different in the context of investor and state mediation compared to commercial mediation, commercial international mediation, or really domestic mediation involving a public entity? What's different in the investor and state context? Mercedes, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Uh, greetings to everybody, whatever the, the, the time zone is. Um, uh, and thank you, Frauke, and thank you to the ICSID for having encountered me for this interesting webinar. Well, you see, the, the differences, it, it, investment state mediator cannot be compared to commercial domestic mediation, but there the, are the huge difference because the moment you go to the to the international, no matter if it's commercial or investment. I mean, the, the fact of needing to make people feel at home, which is something very important in the international arena, adds something different. So, but when we talk about comparing international commercial mediation to international investor state or investor state mediation is always international. Uh, I don't think that the, the difference is in, in nature. The difference is in degree. Things become more complicated, everything. I mean, the, the size of the parties, the, the cross-culturality, I would like to address that, and, and the, 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 the whole thing. But the leap is a qualitative one, not a quantitative one to me, in, in the sense of in, in, in talking about differences. And then, uh, you, you, you don't only have people coming from different, you know, cultures in sense of their, their background, their not only citizenship, but I mean, the, the, the language and everything. On top of that, you have on one side parties for whom 
their language is the business language, okay? They're, it's a business mind, business thing. And on the other hand, you may have, you may have on the state uh, side, you may have people who, of course, they come from their world, which is the world of politics, the world of public administration. Things are done differently in different um, contexts. And this is something that, of course, they've been negotiating among themselves. Of course, they know that. But, you know, medi mediating means assisting parties to negotiate. And negotiate is something that is demanding for parties. And a mediation means something even more demanding because they've already done their, the effort to negotiate and now they're trying to reach an agreement. So any of us, when we're put in a situation of, of extra stress, we, in a way, there, there is all this own culture that comes to us. So uh, one has to expect the reactions of um, which one often sees in, in investor state, which is lack of trust. I mean, the party doesn't trust the other party. And there's there, often there is this issue or this role for the mediator to tell to say, look, I mean, let's put ourselves in the context of a public administration that, um, speech or or tell to the state party, let's put ourselves in the context of a business speech. And th there, there are lots of nuances, but I think that uh, once again, the, the difference is, is in, is in, 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 it's a leap, it's a qualitative leap that demands, demands extra, extra um, involvement, extra commitment, but there's always a lot of involvement and commitment on the side of the mediator, but I don't know, extra alert on everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for pointing to that a sort of cultural difference, not only region, nationality, but also organizational, how to handle things as an as an as one of the added um, complexities in investor state disputes and how that um, can be addressed. Uh, Martin, would you have anything to add from your side on experiences and how does it differ? Thank you, Falco. Thank you for inviting me and I'm Happy to be here. Hello to, to everybody. I totally, obviously, agree with Mercedes. Uh, uh, I also would say investor state mediation is not that different to international commercial mediation. However, it's much more complex. It's much more complex because some aspects are extremely difficult. Like um, in a normal international commercial mediation, it's already difficult to have people around the table, the right people around the negotiation table and people with authority. Now, when you deal with the state, you can imagine that this, the, 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 the situation is much more complex. Who's representing the state? In which way? How is a settlement agreement authorized or implemented? There are different rules. We spoke about the exit rules, the IBA rules, etc. All this has to be dealt with and the mediator has to speak with the parties about this. So I would say it's similar, but it is um, um, much, much more complex. Um, and then there are some other points like um, confidentiality, whereas in a commercial mediation, you stop me, Falk, if I speak too long, huh? because Please, one speak we for hours like about that, okay? <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Bill also wants to add something, of course, um, confidentiality, for example, in international commercial mediation, typically the parties want absolute confidentiality, typically. There's one exception with ICC rules that the mere fact that the mediation exists is not confidential anymore. However, in an investor state mediation, the state might have an interest certain degree of transparency and they will have to talk about this and adopt the rules. Uh, for example, the exit rules and make them a little bit more, not saying flexible, but adopt them to their own situation. So I totally agree with Mercedes. Once again, it is similar, but it is much more complex. And uh, there's a lot of requirements and points the mediator has to be aware of. So mm -hmm. I stop here because time is running. <laughs> <laughs> you will get another chance to contribute, Martin, no worries. And <laughs> um, so you pick up the point of um, authority to negotiate and authority to settle. And just for our participants, we've addressed exactly that aspect um, with Alejandro Caballoleda from the Energy Secretariat, who has developed a model instrument, um, which is intended for domestic legal framework to assist with exactly those kinds of questions. Who has the authority to settle? early on, for example, in an investment disputes when there
there is no arbitration um, already ongoing. And what other aspect states can be in place, put in place on the organizational structure um, to assist um, settlement or effective management? It's much broader of investment disputes, and it's also part of the ancestral discussion. Bill, you've been really patient so far, but I want to make sure that um, <laughs> we'll have your thoughts on this first question as well. What what are differences from your experience? Uh, thank you, Franca. Thank you um, to, to everybody for coming and of course to Mercedes and Martin. Always a pleasure to work with them as well. Um, I, I agree uh, completely with what's said, uh, particularly the point about culture clashes and the public versus private sector culture clash that, that I think takes a lot of management. And I'll say a bit about that under challenges later on. And the only other point, uh, perhaps fresh point I would make about the difference is, is that often the investment at the heart of the dispute is very public. It may be a, uh, an energy uh, facility of some kind, an airport, a road, etc. Mm -hmm. We all know with publicly known projects, they can become uh, political footballs kicked between uh, the parties in dispute. So I think there is, in addition to the usual concerns, there is a concern about how an outcome will look. Uh, but not just co uh, commercially, but also politically itself. And, and will it be the subject of criticism? Uh, and if so, does that criticism matter? So, uh, and that picks up really following Martin's point about confidentiality. Um, th th there isn't uh, often, uh, or isn't always, I should say, the same level of confidentiality available because of the need for government scrutiny and public scrutiny. And therefore the, 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 the framework changes a bit it's perfectly manageable, but it needs to be thought about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thank you. Yeah, especially on that aspect of um, uh, government obligations to disclose, which can uh, and often lie in the domestic legislation, not just on treaties, as we often think in the investor state context these days. Bill, you mentioned challenges. So what are challenges you have faced in an investment mediation and how can these be overcome by the mediator or by the parties through sort of process management. Yeah, thank thank you, um, Franca. And I'm sure that process management is something we speak a lot about on this call uh, because it's absolutely central to uh, to the effectiveness of the process. I, very quickly, I picked up three possible challenges. There'll be many others as well, but here are three that I picked up. The first one uh, Martin's already touched on, which is uh, the delegation of authority. Often a state party won't be in a position to delegate authority in, let's say, a more meaningful way, or at least a way that is more typical of what a commercial party would expect. And so there's a clash of expectations that I think can lead to um, concerns being expressed. Uh, so hold on, can I stop you here, Bill? Can you yeah. say a bit more about delegation of authority? What do you mean? Do you mean um, negotiation authority or settlement authority or what kind of delegation authority? Well, it could mean either either settlement, either authority to reach terms. We usually will mean that. Can off, can sometimes mean authority to negotiate as well. Mm -hmm. Although I think clearly one would need. Um, authority at least to, to negotiate in order to make a process worthwhile. But I think that these, these things really emphasize to me um, the importance of process design, because there are in every mediation, whether it's investor state or anything else, there are going to be uh, problems like that which need to be thought through. And the more they're thought through in advance, um, the better. So I, it's my invariable practice to try and design with the parties in an investor state context, a process which makes sense to them and which um, responds to the concerns uh, that they that they raise. Uh, and so I think that's critically important. And and the second I think area for this is that it's there's it's been my experience that uh, authority levels can be escalated once progress is being made. Uh, so for example, in one. Uh, I did over the last couple of years with an, with an EU member state. Uh, I began mediating amongst the representatives whom they chose. And then when we'd made quite a lot of progress, uh, I asked if it could be escalated to a certain, uh, effectively to a cabinet committee, and that was agreed upon. And, and so you don't have to finish with the level of authority you start with. So that was a very quick point on authority. The second is decision-making. Um, decision-making 
it, it, it can be different and sometimes more cautious from government parties than it can be, although not always from private parties. Um, I, I have had people say to me in a mediation that it is safer and easier for them to let the arbitrator decide than it is for them to exercise discretion. Um, I think what it leads to for me is the recognition that having an effective um, understanding and articulation of the reasons for settlement, the rationale that settlement should be at this level instead of that level is, is critical because these things need to be justified in other places. And so one finds sometimes that, that even if a deal can be reached at a, what you might call a commercial level, there then has to be quite a complicated potentially process of saying, how do we rationalize this according to the contract, according to the technical questions and so on. And, and very quickly, if I may, the, 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 the third point I wanted to the challenge, I think is timing. Timing is different. Um, I think I, I would understand if parties in an investor state context said to me, uh, as they have done, um, you can't possibly think that a one day model of mediation is remotely relevant or appropriate. And that on the whole has been my experience. Um, uh, and uh, along with the unpredictability of events like um, elections. And I, in fact, I did sit down in the first meeting uh, with a state party in an investor state mediation about three or four years ago. And the phone rang of one of the participants and it was the attorney general from their country. The attorney general asked to be put on speakerphone and then explain to everybody there that he had had a change of mind and that it was politically unacceptable for that government to be seen to be using assistance in their negotiations. So that was an unexpected turn up. So those will just very quickly will be three areas of challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill, to point out to sort of um, authority aspects, um, negotiation, settlement, decision making within government, explanation, uh, rational, rationale for decision making or settlement, timing aspects. Um, and a political perception, if you will. So one, one um, follow-up question. In your experience, Bill, talking of timing, how long, um, ha what is the range of investment mediations you have seen? Uh, well, I have a colleague who, who uh, was involved in one, which is resolved. It took eight years. Um, I would say that's very unusual in my experience. Uh, anywhere between a few months, two or three months, uh, and about 18 months, I think, is the longest I've been involved in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. And for our listeners and participants, we have um, in the exit mediation rules at the very early stage at the first session, a provision where the parties are asked to identify um, the process. How could a settlement be achieved, which is different, as we've um, pointed out in the first um, uh, part of the webinar, maybe requiring a different uh, process in an investor state dispute. And it may change, as Bill identified throughout the mediation through process design choices, um, but at least that parties know that connection between the negotiation and the settlement and how that would look. Um, Martin, over to you. What are um, uh, um, challenges that you see and how can the mediator engage with those? Um, thanks, Mark. I, I would like to share with you actually two challenges I, I lived through. Uh, one uh, in one uh, investor state uh, mediation case in which I was a counselor. And, and I would like to continue a little bit the discussion about authority, Bill, um, you deepened. Um, actually, I lived the situation where a state agent had full power, full unlimited power uh, on the surface, let's put it that way. And then at some point the mediation got stuck and the mediator did his job, tried to understand what's happening, can't go in all the details. I was counsel, I was uh, watching this. And at some point, this was extremely impressive, uh, this person groaned at the mediator and said, Mr. Mediator, I want to see my children grow up. <laughs> and there was no more question, everything was said and that was the end of the mediation. These are situations which are extremely difficult. And I would say the mediator has done everything he could do, but there was a limitation there. And I can't go in, into the details of this country, but it was just extremely difficult. And uh, again, he did, he was very cautious 
and he had everything he could uh, done, but um, there were limitations. And the, the other one was when I was a mediator in investor state um, mediation, um, there were three parties who wanted to organize this mediation and one didn't show up. The state was there, one of the commercial parties was there, and the third commercial party just didn't show up. So what are you doing? As a mediator, I spoke to council around the globe to to convince, to get the right people, to, to explain uh, how mediation works, what it's all about. They even tried to obtain from an arbitral tribunal a uh, prohibition that this mediation takes place. They switched their position, which was not, I mean, they didn't get an award in that sense. So the mediation could proceed and um, finally did among these two parties. And months later, one of the council was so nice, called me up and said, listen, on the base of what the work we've done together, actually the three parties finally found an agreement. But th these are situations I lived through and I thought were extremely complicated. In one, you could do something, in the other, you are stuck. And it just points out um, to the to the need for mediation that it is based on the idea of um, parties uh, desiring to find an amicable solution and negotiating, and that may not be the case in all um, in all environments, um, and it may change over time. And maybe Damon, you could put in the chat. Um, we summarize sort of. Um, how to identify the, uh, some factors to identify the suitability of mediation for an investment disputes um, that we published um, in the Clover mediation blog. And that might be helpful if um, to share that link. Mercedes, now you were the patient one. Do you have um, <laughs> thoughts to add? Well, I, I agree with what Bill and Martin have said. And, but I would also like to touch upon the issue of authority and because it's it is common in all mediation. One of the characteristics of mediation is that people take the responsibility for their agreement. They are not delegating on a third, be the arbitral tribunal, the court or the, the local court or to decide for them. And so when there is not a safe legal environment for the public servant to negotiate, a safe one means that whatever he or she uh, negotiates and th there are a clear, um, clear frames according to, to, to which that person can negotiate and can settle an issue. If there is always the, if there is there the risk of these people being considered corrupt, if there is the risk of, I mean, if there are all these things, all these risks pointing to that person, it comes to a moment that, that it, it, it is too much for that person. I mean, Martin has, has put the extreme example. But uh, but that it's common in all and in, in in all in all um, investor state uh, negotiations and uh, and mediations. The the it is important, and we I think we will be seeing that that every jurisdiction rules upon. I mean, has legislation and clear frames according to which frameworks according to which. Um, the public servants can settle uh, cases. If not, I mean that's that's an obstacle that can that, that it's always there, and, and and of course the mediator can do, but uh, and and it's something that you prepare in advance and talk about. And to, but if there is no legislation protecting that, it's very difficult. But I think we'll be seeing this change the the, the same way we'll be seeing. Uh, one of the challenges that there used to be in investor state mediations and now is being little by little overcome is that mediation was not something people were familiar with and for a for a state to be seen to settle cases with someone else could be perceived even politically used as 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 a defeat as someone who doesn't uh, i mean a government that that does not defend properly the the, the interests of the state but now more and more we are having different jurisdictions jurisdictions legislating about mediation. And then the full discourse is different. The moment the government is proposing to their citizens to use mediation to settle their private disputes, that, that you have, you know, the mediation acts, you, oh, the whole thing, it, it, it's different now because you can show as, as a government can say, we also do that. I mean. We 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 live what we preach, and, and the whole thing start changing. So 
we will be safe, but certainly a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you see that and you it's linked, um, I think, also to the timing point. In the early 2000s, we had many arbitration, investor state arbitrations against a particular Latin American country. And at that point, the political um, atmosphere was not such that there was settlement. Fast forward 10 years and many of these cases were then settled. Something shifted. And overall, um, the authority question is not um, one that is uh, only uh, relevant in the context of mediation. You see 30 to 40 percent of investor state arbitrations end without a ruling by the tribunal. So at one point, the parties find a way um, to deal with the issue and to resolve the issues on, on their own. And that is, I think, where we need to look further in and legislation, as Mercedes pointed out, and awareness and education as it's happening in the Uncitral Working Group and uh, through work of the Energy Charter Secretariat certainly helps there. Um, Martin, over to you. What mediator qualifications in your experience are important? Do you need to be an arbitrator to mediate? What um, That is oftentimes a, a myth um, that uh, we want to address here as well. What are your thoughts, <laughs> mediator qualifications? Thanks, Margaret. I don't want to be provocative. I would say certainly not an arbitrator. I mean, I was a lawyer and an arbitrator before as well, but I stopped that and I'm only doing mediations. No. You certainly don't have to be an arbitrator. You might have been an arbitrator at some point in your life or a litigator, but this is nothing. It's certainly not a qualification which is needed to be a good mediator, whether in commercial or investor state disputes. I would say for me, the most important qualification is to have intercultural competence. You need to have cultural awareness in these cases. Without cultural awareness, investor state mediations are necessarily, and that's also a big distinction to commercial mediations, are necessarily intercultural because it's a foreign investment in another country. So you need to have this, you can study it, you can practice it. Some people have it naturally through upbringing, education, they grow up in four countries, they studied in a fifth and a sixth country. So it is really, it depends and it's different from one person to the other. And then we have uh, the exit. I encourage everybody to read it. Background paper, which is fantastic. We have the IBA rules and there are also IMI documents with qualifications. Basically, what they all say, basically, put it in a nutshell, is you need an experienced mediator, somebody who is recognized by, I would say, an international organization. He has to have some experience in dispute resolution, which involves states. That can be different, could be in international arbitration, but not because of the qualification as an arbitrator, but to be, to, to have seen how states handle dispute resolution. And I also would encourage people to do peace uh, mediation. That's also a very fantastic way of understanding how states actually deal. You can study this at Vienna University, for example, you know, as a center for peace mediation. It's a bit more difficult to practice it, uh, I'm afraid. But uh, these are interesting uh, approaches. Um, what else would I would add? I would say languages. I mean, speaking about an in cultural, inter, intercultural environment, you certainly need to have, ideally, knowledge of the languages. You want to speak with the parties. Let's say English is the common language, but then you have uh, two parties with different languages. They would like to speak to you in their mother tongue in a caucus. You better know the language. And then I would say there is one qualification, which is for me uh, at least very new. It's in the background paper of EXIT, which is asking for the understanding of the context framework of investor state, the economic, legal, social, cultural considerations. You can also replace considerations by interests. And that is something very difficult to gain. How do you gain this? How do you get this kind of experience? Very difficult. I think we would have to deepen the conversation. I want to stop here because uh, my two colleagues who also want to say something to that subject. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Martin. Bill, what would you like to add to this? Uh, so to, one point that Martin's touched on and then a, a, another point as well. I, I, 
I think there's this coming back to the, the challenge of cross-cultural. I've often felt that uh, um, my role as a mediator was to be a cultural interpreter from one to another. And I think that's that's a large part of what's going on. It's not just national cultures, but others as well. Uh, I suppose the qualification, it's not really a qualification, it's more of a, a, an ability, I suppose, um, would be the capacity to build a process rather than be a slave to one. I, I think often, if one makes the mistake of inviting people into a preset process, then we shouldn't be surprised if they have reservations about it. If we invite them to build with us a process that meets their concerns and the other party's concerns, they're much more likely, I think, or what I find, to, um, to participate. So I think um, early discussions about what the process, what process will help, what it should look like, uh, taking into consideration all their concerns is really important. For the mediation itself, who should participate, who needs to be involved in some other way, somehow have a place within the whole mediation, right? I want you to, I want to get out the difference um, on the mediation, what you have in mind on the process design as compared to the very set arbitration framework that many of um, our audience might be familiar with. Can you say a couple of words to process design on that, what you have in mind? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. you, you might start, for example, with uh, with information. So do the parties have enough information at that point in order to enable them to make some sensible decisions? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. If they don't, or to the extent they don't, that's something that has to be addressed as part of the process. Um, do, ha, ha, what kind of um, technical expertise, if any, needs to be present in the, in the mediation? Mm -hmm. And if so, How's that going to be dealt with? Um, who's going to attend? Where are we going to meet? Um, leaving aside COVID, uh, uh, what what sort of, you know, if, if you go to a country for a week, it, that's fine. Is it helpful to have that intensity of a whole week of meetings? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's too much. Or is it more helpful to be having uh, more meetings of shorter duration? And so these are kind of process design points. You can't cover them all in advance, but you can put some on the table and begin to give people a sense of participation in the design. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Bill, for that illustration. Um, why don't we take one of the questions that we've had while we're talking about process design, um, involvement of non-disputing parties. Have you experienced with involvement of non-disputing parties uh, in the process design and the mediations that you held? Sorry, just to clarify the question, do you mean parties who are not party to that particular dispute but have some involvement in it or, or what? That's right. Um, sort of um, in the investor state context and the arbitration context, this may come out as, for example, a local NGO or an international NGO who would like to submit some information for the dispute or participate in some other form. Have you seen any of that? The well, I, for, sorry. for all of you, oh, yeah. No, 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 really, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I've got, I've got one example. Uh, so I mediated uh, a dialogue between <clears throat> um, national government, a, in a country's largest investor, and then a lot of uh, um, uh, ecology groups, protest groups, and local um, government as well, about the levels of emissions from a particular plant and the policy, the overall policy of the government on emission levels in that country. Uh, so that involved the very full participation uh, of uh, at least one NGO, uh, as well as uh, government and investors, uh, local government, federal government, et cetera, cantonal government, uh, and so on. So that, yes, that, that involved um, NGO participation. Uh, and that brings its own um, challenges. So through process design, they can be built into um, uh, the mediation specific to the circumstances. Another question we I have in the chat. Sorry, go ahead. No, it was good. Just to say, if there is a lack of information, which is part of the actually the non-understanding among the parties, you try to get 
what we call an expert, but it could be an NGO, could be whoever can provide this information. I have not seen it in an investor state um, uh, mediation, but I've seen it uh, many times in, in commercial mediations that you have other people with agreement, of course, of the party. So they propose, come in to deliver the information. Sometimes you have even two experts, very interesting. Um, who don't agree, but uh, and they don't have to agree because you're not in arbitration, but nevertheless, you can ask mediator, ask them questions with at some point, convince both parties to move on. It's actually a lack of information. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this has is... to be, as Bill said, designed yeah. each time particularly. Yeah. Sorry. Mercedes? Mercedes. I'm sorry, Franco. Okay. I, I know I'm jumping in because you wanted to address another question, but very, very quickly. I mean, the, Herman Furby's question is, is linked to the fact that you in any case, but in certainly in investor state mediators, mediations, one needs to make sure who needs to be at the table. And for the state, it may very well be that there is the need in a way to address, uh, I mean, civil society in a way that it's part of the way they will, the state will have to handle the, the, the result of the mediation or, or the, the whole deal. So, so it's, it's, it's linked to the, the points in that Bill was making about uh, touching upon the, the, um, designing the process. At the, at the beginning, one needs to understand who needs to be at the table, which are the needs of the parties, and then one of the need, the interests of the parties, and it may very well be that on the side of the state, there, there are these needs, and then you need to talk about them and think, but think in advance, because it is for the parties to decide who will be at the table. I mean, you won't be able to, I mean, to have other parties if, if, if the parties involved are not in agreement with that. And who is at the table and how that participation would look like, right? Those two aspects are then addressed with the parties and the mediators. So it's different from the procedure we see in international investment arbitration, where there is a preset criteria, for example, in certain rules or environments. Another question, um, one sentence or two sentences, um, perhaps uh, from one or two of you, is about um, bargaining inequality, often perceived in investor state um, context that it's the state uh, that has more power and the investor has less. In practice, we know that can be the other way around as well. The investor may be the one that is really needed uh, in country. Um, but have you seen these uh, bargaining inequalities and how have you addressed them? I leave it up to you who would like to go first. I mean, bargaining inequalities happen in, in all sorts of mediations, not only in investor state mediations. You can very well find that in, 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 in commercial mediations. But um, of course, at least in my experience, it comes to a moment that, uh, that there are uh, that, that it's a bit of shuttle mediation, in the sense that, that there is a moment where you are going from one caucus room, from one private session room to the other. So, and the, you can help the parties because this, it, the moment it is linked to the to how uh, convinces the party that it's, it's in in its in, in 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 his or her interest to 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 move on in the mediation and to and to and to uh, to accept the deal. Um, this idea of equal power of parties is more a theoretical idea of that real idea. And, and, and on top of that, we must remember that we, as a mediator, you never get to know everything. And there is no need for that. I mean, it's not a, uh, I mean, I'm not a priest to whom the people are supposed to explain whatever happens in, the, in their conscience. So, so um, when it's important to make room for the party, to, to, to be able to speak to the mediator and express that, and you can address it or say, you, it, I have the feeling that you may be, a, but, but certainly, I mean, these bargaining differences, uh, inequalities are not, ex, are not a characteristic of the investor state mediation. And, and when you have them, you deal with them in the, in the sense that making sure that people can uh, address that no matter that the, 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 their priorities are satisfied. If their mm -hmm. priorities are satisfied, it is for the party to decide. And of course, you've worked with each party to, under, to well understand their needs, their interests. So, I mean, you can double check with them. You can do the, 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 the reality check with them to assist them move forward in the, the in their decision-taking process. But it's it's something that happens in many mediations. 
Mm -hmm. And to identify for the parties, again, to assess suitability of negotiation for your conflict resolution. If that is not what you come to, uh, uh, to a conclusion, that maybe arbitration is better suited for that particular process to address, then that is uh, a fine answer as well. Bill, would you like to add anything or move on? What are you? Uh, I don't just, want to cut you. I'll, I'll just add one sentence then, Franca, since, since yeah. you invite me to. Uh, um, the, as, as Mercedes says, the, these kind of dynamics are going on the whole time in every mediation. I think they're often, they exist sometimes in the minds of people more than in reality. Um, but I think there is also a, dist a useful distinction between a substantive imbalance and a procedural imbalance and that's worth conjuring with so substantively if one party has more for example economic power or some other kind of power that's a substantive difference it's just a fact of life they have to negotiate within that um they, they may have a better or a, a stronger or weaker procedural um power in the sense they might be better negotiators they might have a better sense of how to use the process they might be more articulate and so on. So there are things that go to process. And I think those we, we can, as mediators, perhaps make more of an have more of an influence on than we can on the substantive differences, which are just life. Thank you. Thanks for that distinction on, on where um, how where does the bargaining inequality, if there is one lie, and um, then depending on that answer, how did this address uh, varies. So let's move on to what is your advice? And here in the interest on time, let's combine what's your advice to disputing parties and to counsel participating in investment mediation or advising clients for investment mediations. What are the benefits? And Mercedes, maybe you'd like to start? Well, my advice to both would be commit to the process and participate in it appropriately. That there is huge work on the side of the mediator to, to prepare everything for them and for them to know where they will be so that uh, and working in this process is at the beginning so that uh, so that this can happen. But certainly we need parties to commit to the process and to commit they need to know. So if mediation is thing is seen as something they are, I mean it is fine if they are not familiar with it. I mean that's fine, but it's for the for the mediator to to, to build on that. But but then if they don't trust the process, if they see it as something that I am, I need to go through it, but I, I or they, or they, then it is very difficult, both party or council. I mean, if they don't trust the, the process and, and they don't commit, it is extremely difficult to make things move uh, because, I mean, you can, you need people to participate and to participate appropriately. The role of council is of the essence especially in the huge cases of, of investor state, it is of the essence, uh, their knowledge about the mediation and their, they need to be allies of the mediator. You are there to see, you as a mediator are there to assist them, but they need to, to do their work and they often do. And they are, in my experience, in those huge cases, you find very well an experienced uh, council. Lawyers, mm -hmm. council experience in mediation or knowledgeable of mediation. Thank you, Martin. What are you, what's your advice for this party's council? Say in a nutshell, I would say uh, opt for mediation first. Uh, for investment arbitration only, ultima ratio. Um, if mediation doesn't work, and uh, why? Why is this beneficial? Uh, there's something which is very important, at least for me. I would say that mediation is as if it was made for investor state disputes. The reason is that there are many layers of interests. We, we, you all know, we don't have the time to get into details. We do interest-based mediation. And here we have much more interest groups than we actually have at the surface stakeholders. Sometimes these third parties can come in. We just spoke about that, but give it a chance to, 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 to work with together with the mediator and the other party to find out about these different layers of interest. You have only this chance in a mediation, will not have this chance in an arbitration. That's why I'm saying, particular for investor state mediations, mediation first. That's all I want to say here. It's really important to me. <laughs> Thank you. And it's there's actually a research out um, by one of our attendees. Anna Howard um, has done an extensive research on mediation 
which identified that actually some council in the commercial context I'd, um, opt for mediation, would prefer to opt to mediation first before negotiating because you have the third facilitator in the room to facilitate the negotiations when the dispute is already ev evolving. Um, so I thought that was an interesting aspect. And here the timing comes back. Uh, mediation may come in early. It may come in later alongside an arbitration. There's a question in the chat. Um, in our experience, there is no impact on the mediation, whether or not it's alongside an arbitration, the mediation remains the mediation. It just um, once uh, uh, the, the, the process uh, can move fast back on the arbitration track, should the mediation not succeed. Bill, what are your thoughts? What are your advice on counsel and disputing parties? Ah, where to start? <clears throat> okay, um, the, 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 many of us on this call uh, uh, had a former life as lawyers, uh, and I think one of the, the, whilst there are some upsides, one of the dangers is that we learn very well how to articulate an argument and kind of throw it across the table. I get that completely. Um, in mediation, uh, you need to learn how to rationalize and justify your, your views in a way that the other party can relate to. Because if their analysis, for example, is a political, not a commercial, or a legal, not a political, or a commercial, not a legal analysis, they will receive it in a completely different way. And so rather than just, as it were, prepare in one's own bubble, and get all the arguments ready and uh, be ready to defend, uh, I would say there's a real uh, importance in thinking through what will resonate with your counterparty and how you can present your views and priorities and so on in a way that, that works for them as well. I think the other, well, two quick points, uh, work with the mediator from the very outset. Don't expect the mediator to just deliver you a package. Here is a mediation. We start at number one and we finish at number 20. I would say work with the mediator and, you know, mediators should invite you to um, get involved in those discussions. And thirdly, be patient. These things, if you look at the kind of a chart of a mediation uh, with optimism and pessimism, they go like this. And you have to sometimes say, I'm just here. Uh, Mercedes, I think at the be beginning of this question said, commit to the process. That's ex You have to commit whether you're here or here. Uh, until there's absolutely no possibility of further progress. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for sharing that different approaches and, and um, putting some reality check on how a mediation uh, may, may feel like along the process um, uh, as well. So um, what are your top three lessons learned from your experience? Bill, maybe you just continue while you were just, um, we start with you. Top three lessons. <clears throat> um, well, they would probably be, ironically, be the ones I've just mentioned about advice to council and parties. Get the structure right, uh, which involves setting good expectations as well. You know, we, in the end, if you strip everything away about mediation, it's an environment in which to make some good decisions. That's what it's about. And that's partly through engaging with the other party, but it's also partly through your own thought process. So whatever structure is important, not to win, but to make good decisions, is the structure you need to put in place. And that, if you start with that question, that will tell you about who needs to be there, uh, what kind of process, how long it might take, what you do with confidentiality, where you get the right information from, whether the other party need to give you information and so on. So I would, if, you know, I, I always say to people at the beginning of mediations, um, this is about making good decisions. And let's use that as our benchmark and we can work out what else is necessary from that point. Thank you. Martin, Mercedes. Martin, would you like to add first? Oh, yeah. Go first, Mercedes, no? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I would, re I would say well, there's many things that we th the three of us have said here, the, the four of us, because Prague is also adding very, very <laughs> interesting comments. That, But I think that it could be true of any mediation, but be ready for the unexpected. Be ready for the unexpected. Tenacity, because it, it, you you need to be there for the parties. And when 
there's this this feeling that they are down and this is not going to work and they're they're all getting extra calls and all you know all that thing tenacity if you have prepared in advance with them i usually work with a questionnaire in advance so you get all the information i have worked with them be there have worked and prepared the, read everything be, have prepared very well for the mediation so that you are there to have the right words to keep them on the table if there's still a minimum a minimal possibility for them and uh, well and resilience and patience and but actually i mean it's very demanding it is demanding for the parties to to settle cases so it is demanding for the mediators but that's it's a huge work also mm. Yeah, the role of the parties is uh, very active, uh, especially if you compare it to how it sometimes appears in the investment arbitration environment where the council does a lot of work during the hearing, whereas here in the negotiation, you really need the parties to be uh, at the forefront. Martin, what are three lessons learned from your experience? Quickly, uh, we spoke already about many of these points, but I would say the importance of caucuses at the right moment, we didn't speak so much about caucuses and we don't have the time to get into this, to understand the, the background, the cultural background, the political background. Caucuses, I would say, again, cultural competence, very close. And for me, the most important in any mediation is authority and how to identify the right people. These are for me the three points at that stage. But it all goes with process design, it goes with um, be expect the, the most uh, <laughs> amazing uh, development. Um, Mercedes touched on it all goes together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Let's look over um, to the questions. We have a question on actionable steps for students. Uh, what I can recommend there is there was an investment mediation mood just organized um, in Colombo. And if you Google that, um, you can see that we had a uh, Martin, for example, was involved in that. So that is something for students to engage in. There's another investment mediation mood coming up in March uh, in Japan and Kyoto. So that um, could be something for students to engage in. And we've had um, aspects about perception on uh, uh, bias or appointees from different parts of the world. And here I just want to underline mediators are appointed by party agreement. So the parties are in charge uh, in order to identify who they think is suitable and can certainly consider regional and nationality qualifications and um, who they think is most uh, best suited for resolving the dispute. And um, we have a question in the chat um, for the supporting role of the Secretariat, please. And thank you um, for for sharing your experience on that. We certainly are here to assist the parties and the mediators throughout the process, organizing um, administration, uh, we call it, and what does administration really mean? Facilitating communications, facilitating meeting organizations, venue, uh, information security, and all of that uh, would come as a package um, from the Secretariat. So with that, um, I know we are over our time uh, already in our webinar. It was hugely enjoyable, certainly for me, and I'm sure for our audience as well, to have so much uh, information and insights shared by the three of you. And so thank you very much. And this concludes our webinar series on investment mediation insights. And I look forward to meet uh, many of you over email, over video, or one day in person to continue our investment mediation adventures. So until then, be well and be safe. And thank you again.